being present. Well, what does that mean? Well, we think being present is just being here, existing, being around. And I think many of you know that just being in the room, physically present, doesn't necessarily mean that you are really there. You've had people in your house and you don't even remember them being there when you have a gathering. Some of you may have grown up with parents in your house that were there, but not there. Still couldn't talk to them. They might have been distracted doing other things and didn't have time for you. So while they were physically present, were they really there? Did they really exist in the moment? Did they really get all the things out of the moment that they should have gotten? This world is full of distractions, right? We got work, school, hobbies, church. We got internet. We got information. It's almost too connected. You know, there was a time if you wanted to get a message over to, say, Japan, you had to wait a few months for them to get it. There were times when stuff was going on. By the time you read it, it was over and done with. Now somebody has a thought. You could get that thought by as soon as they think it. You could get from here to around the world and probably be there sometime tomorrow. You wouldn't have to take a boat ride and get there three months later. There was a time that if somebody was going somewhere far away, if your son decided he wanted to go to America and you were in Europe, you said bye to your son because you might not never see him again. That's how long the trip took and expensive and all the other stuff that goes along with it. You may not ever see that person again. And now somebody can go and you can see them next week. We're very connected. But with that comes a lot of pressure. Think about the pressure of your phone. I always tell Adrian, man, I will go back to pages in a minute. Beepers, if you will. I used to walk through the mall and I had my beeper and I thought I was cool. You know, you just teenage. Some of y'all don't know what beepers are. Y'all be all right. Somebody, beep, 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 beep. You look down, you see a phone number. And you put it back on your hip and keep on walking. And when you had a quarter, you got some change, go to the pay phone. Or when you got back home, you would call them and ask what they wanted. Now, if you looked at it and had 911 at the end, then you knew, drop everything, let me go find out what it was. And then you always had that one person, oh, I just want to see what you was doing. Don't use that unless you really want me. But now, somebody will text you, hey, and you can look at it and finish doing what you're doing. And then they'll text you back, question mark, question mark, question mark. I'm like, what is this? Then wait 10 minutes and don't text back. They mad because you didn't respond quick enough. Don't worry about what you was doing. You will have people call you and won't even leave a message because people don't leave messages no more. It's just a missed call. But don't call them back and see what the problem is. You saw I called you? Man, I'm not looking for that. People want you all the time. We so connected. You get so much information, gossip. So much gossip out there. What Will and Jada doing now? How Chris Rock feeling, right? We got to know right now. They made any updates, any news. We need to know what's happening. But that's how the world works, and it pulls you in a lot of different ways. But it makes us feel, because we're so busy, we got so much going on, that we do what we think we can do, which is multitask. I can do two, three, four, five, six things at a time. But really, you can't. You can't multitask. You can do what's called task switching. We think it's multitasking, but really you're just doing a little bit of a lot of different things, and it results in juggling. So what's juggling? You basically can only hold one ball at a time, but you got three or four in the air. The goal is just don't drop one. And we say that's multitasking. Multitasking. You ever seen somebody texting and driving? Can't be done. You, the car is going, but you ain't driving. 
Because in that instance, if something were to happen, your reaction time is shot. Because if I don't know how many of y'all ever been in an accident, it slows down, but it's very fast, right? And if you weren't right there at the, at, the, at the helm to make a quick reaction in less than a second, it could be worse, right? And how many of y'all done avoided and stopped and got that close? Many of us, right? But imagine if you had to look up, throw down the phone, grab the wheel, hit the brake, turn. Oh, you in the front seat, right? So we can't do it. We can just pretend like we can. We think that we can do a lot of these things. But what happens is all your multitasking ends up in less than stellar work. If you type in a document, you got a lot of typos. If you're talking to somebody, you forgot to tell them something. If you're listening to somebody, you missed some key information because you were focused on this, right? That's how multitasking works. Let's go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. When we are busy with the world, we're thinking about the world and what the world has to offer. And in Matthew 13, starting with verse 1, it says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did have not much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, and where it produced the crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. You know, I always thought the ones that fell amongst the thorns was talking about people who had evil thoughts or had other things in their life that were bad, and it would, the devil would choke it out. But listen to what Jesus says in 1322. Let's go down a little bit. He explains his parable in 1322. He says, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and make it unfruitful. Go to Mark 4, 18 through 19. Mark 4, 18 through 19. Same parable. Wording is a little different. And when he explains it here, he says, still others, like seed sown among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So when we have a lot of cares about what's going on in the world, they could be legitimate. They could be things that you got to do. They could be good stuff. It could be stuff related to your kids, your marriage, your, your church, your job. But when it takes your focus off of God, it chokes it out. And the word of God can't grow in you because you're too busy. You got too many other things going on that you heard the word. And the word actually started to take root. But then you started thinking about all the other stuff. How to make money. How to get ahead. How to do things better. What other people need it. All the stuff that's on that list. And it choked the word out. Mainly because you were not there present to focus and listen on that word. Go to Luke. Luke 10. Luke 10, starting in verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. 
Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Are we so distracted by the word, by the world, that we forgot and forget to listen and be present in the word of God? Here it is, Jesus is talking, but she was so distracted and worried about things. Anytime you've prepared for a day, a party, a gathering, it seems like everything got to be perfect, don't it? And the stuff that you forget, does anybody notice that it's a big deal to you? Oh, go get that out. Go get this. Set this up. And you notice no matter how hard you work, you never get through. It's always something extra. It's always something else. It's always a little bit of extra. Think about it when you went to a wedding. That bride is stressed. Everything got to be perfect. And when you walk down and sit down, do you notice the difference between the flowers if they lilac or purple? Do you notice the hue that's coming in the lighting that, is it too bright, is it too? No, you don't care. You're just there to see a wedding. But so much detail, these are not what I ordered. Right? We stress. We pain. But we forget to be in the moment. So many times, so many people have gotten married they so worried about the event, they forget why they really there. They forget to look into the eyes of the one who is there looking at them because of what the world feeds them. The world will feed you whatever you will eat. What do I mean by that? There are times when you will become distracted by the world and people will have a front seat in your life and whatever you listen to the most will take root. You ever listen to a song and you thought it was horrible, but it keep coming on the radio? Next thing you know, that's your favorite song. You listen to somebody talk. Next thing you know, you talking like them and you thought it was goofy the way they talk. Now you done picked up on it. Repetition can sit in your life and it can take root. But we need repetitiveness in God for him to take root. I, I hope this makes sense to you. There was a woman, and her next-door neighbors won the lottery. They owned a pet store. And they said, we're going to go travel the world for about a year. But I need somebody to watch my pet store. So they go to their neighbor, this lady, and they say, hey, do you mind just going down and, and feeding the animals for this year? They're all exotic animals. They don't need to go out, birds and lizards and stuff like that. We'll pay you a handsome sum if you'll do this for her every day. She said, you know what? I don't do anything. I'll be glad to. So she goes to the pet store. She gets the food, and they said, we'll mail the food to you. All you got to do is get it and give it to them. She said, oh, okay, you got no expenses? That's awesome. So she goes down, and she's an animal person. So she's feeding all the animals. <clears throat> and she gets down to this little parrot, beautiful parrot. And she feeds this parrot, and the parrot looks at her and says, ah, you show sure is ugly. And the lady said, oh, my, oh, goofy parrot. Feed the parrot, walk off. She do it the next day, get down to the parrot. The parrot said, ah, you show sure is ugly. After three or four months, this started bug the lady. So she said, you know what, I'm going to get dressed, pretty myself up. Bet that parrot won't keep calling me ugly. She get down to that parrot again. Woo! You show sure is ugly. Five months go by. See, I can't do this no more. It's a bird, but I don't care. It's hurting my feelings. I know I ain't that ugly. She knew she wasn't ugly, but the parent made her feel ugly. So she home crying, and her husband come in and said, what's wrong with you? She said, I'm trying to feed these animals. This bird keep calling me ugly. All the time, he calling me ugly. She, he said, what? Bird calling you ugly? So he go down to the pet store. He grabbed that cage. He said, don't you call my wife ugly no more. He shake that cage, bird flying around, and he said, don't you call my wife ugly no more. And he put the cage down, and the bird said, okay. So he leave. He tell his wife, that bird ain't going to bother you no more. He said, okay. She go back down there, feed the animal. She getting closer to that bird. Feelings starting to get hurt. She get down there, and she feed the bird, and he just look at her, quiet. He don't say nothing. So she said, okay, it worked. She go down the other aisle. She way down there. 
And the bird say, ah, hey. She turn around. So he better not say it. He stick his head out. She look at him. And he look at her. And he say, you know. You know. You know. Now, <laughs> what the world puts in you, it don't have to repeat. It's in you. A lot of times it just reminds you of what it's already put in you. So even though it don't have to say and remind you how to feel, because it's already put roots in you, that all it has to do is reference it, and you go right back to feeling bad. Even when the words are not said and the actions aren't taken. So we got a lady who's offended by a bird. That bird ain't got to say nothing no more. He done put it in us so much. But how do we get God's word in us to get the worldly stuff out? We have to be present. What does that mean? It means doing only one thing at a time. Most of our time, if you think about it, most of our time is spent in the future or in the past. We either think about what was done or we're thinking about what we have to do. But the very little time that we think about what we're doing, we always trying to remember, I wish I wouldn't have, and I hope I can. But we forget to think about what we're doing and how the impact that's going to have. Because the future, if we live in the past, we're almost just rehearsing, right? It's, it's a stone. It, it can't be moved. It can't be changed. It can only be left alone. But you can't do anything about it to change it. You can help make a difference in the future if you cause some hurt in the past. But the only way you can affect the future is by doing something now. You can't think about what you're going to do all the time. You can't think about what was done to you or what you did all the time. You can only fix right now. So when we do that, when we think about the past and only think about the future, we end up just passing by life. We just pass by it. We just see it like a glimpse. We don't remember it. You ever go on a road trip? You don't remember everything about that trip. There are parts of that trip you're like, I don't even remember going through that state. I don't remember even seeing that sign or going by that street because we just focused on the It's just passing us by because we moving. And when we get to our destination, we never remember the trip. We just remember where we left and where we got to. But we never remember the in-between. We have to think about the in-between. We have to live in the now. So how do you do that? Consider thinking about everything that you're doing. And when you do it, do it. That sounds very simple, doesn't it? When you pray, pray. When you talk, talk. When you think, think. Live in the moment. But when we pray, the words are coming out, but we're thinking about something else. When we're talking to you, we talking, we're not listening. We're thinking about the next thing. But very few times do we give undivided attention to any one thing. So when we go through these things, we know there are bills to be paid. We know there are appointments to make. We know there are people that we have to engage with. But if we don't focus on what we have to do right now, it won't get done to the degree that it needs to get done. So we wonder why our prayers aren't being answered because we aren't focused on the prayers. We thinking about God, if you do this, here's what's going to happen. It's almost like the lottery, right? Nobody thinks about what they're scratching off. They think about what they're going to do if what is scratched off is right, right? You ain't thinking about it. If this is, oh man, that's a, ooh, if it, if it, it one more, nope. Right? You thinking about what if I if I do this, I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna scream, I'm gonna do it never happens. But that's how we live life. Um, it's like we just got a bunch of stretch offs. 
if this happened, then I will. But notice how that never happens. We have to focus on what we got. The best way to do it is be a witness to the moment. How do you do that? Take an out-of-body experience to your moments. If your kid is talking to you, you look at that in a situation and say, you know what? Somebody was talking to me, what would I really want? How do I look right now to this person? How do I look right now to God? Be a witness to the moment and be honest with yourself. Am I really here or am I somewhere else? Can I really do a good job with what I'm doing or am I missing something? Because when you miss those moments, you never get them back. The disciples struggled as well. Go to Luke 9. Luke 9. Starting at verse 46. It says, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is the least among you that is the greatest. So when we read this, we see the disciples are arguing who's going to be at the top of the heap. They're thinking about when Jesus leaves, who's going to be in charge? But they're not listening to what Jesus is talking about. He says, whoever takes this little child, whoever takes this little child, whoever looks at this little child, whoever focuses on this little child welcomes me, right? Tell me this. If you were always thinking about the past or thinking about the future, who's the only person involved in that? You. You don't think about other people when you're thinking about these things. At what point, if that is the way that you think, would you think about the people who are less than you in your mind? They're not in your future, nor are they in your past. They're just in your present. So if you always thinking about the future and the past, you never think about them. Think about it this way. When you're thinking about your past and you're thinking about your future, how often do you think about God? Because sometimes he's not in your past and he's not in your future to that degree that you're thinking about him. But he is in your now. So when you think about God, you have to think about him in the now. Because in the future, in your mind, is only you. You think about God, but many times we think about what he will do for me. God, if you do this, then I will be. Lord, if I pray this now, then I will be. Or I will get. Or I will become. Or life will change for me in however way you come up with. But when you think about what God can do right now, it's not about you. It becomes about him. Because now he may tell you to go talk to somebody who's not in your future. He may tell you to speak to somebody who you would have glossed over. Because how often do I look at people when I walk in a place? I'm worried about what I'm going to get. I'm not worried about the people around me. So it's very difficult for me to listen to God and him to tell me, do you see that lady? And I'm like, no, I ain't seen nobody. I didn't. I don't know. My mind works so fast, as do yours. I don't even think about myself half the time. I had to take Adrian to the doctor with me. Why? Because when I get home, she said, what they say? Take this. For what? Uh, I don't really know. <laughs> I figure they know what they're talking about. I don't know. How many questions did you ask? I didn't. I told them what was going on. They said, here, take this. And I said, okay. Reggie, you didn't tell them this, you didn't tell them that. You didn't ask them what this stuff was. I didn't know. I ain't nothing. I figured they knew, so what well, purpose of me asking all these questions? I ain't no doctors. <laughs> I don't know do the information no way. And she get in there, and the doctor can't even walk out the room. Well, what about this? Because sometimes if you're the doctor say, oh, you know what? He didn't say that last time. And I'm sitting there like some child kicking my feet. Okay. And they talk to me, and I, I don't know, man. Mrs. Alzheimer, we think you're going to have to have surgery. Now I'm like, what, huh? Who, what, huh? Now I'm here. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> For what? And then they calm me down again. Okay, you're good again. Because you're just thinking about stuff. 
I don't even want to be here. And if I don't want to be there, guess what? I'm not there. I'm somewhere else. I got to be. I don't want to be in this place. That's how we live our life. We can step out real quick while physically being here. But guess what? Kids that grow up, daddy wasn't really there. Mama was always gone. Like I was there. Were you really? My friend was there, but were they really? You ever talk to somebody and they looking at TV? Oh, just hang up the phone. Ain't it horrible? Huh? What'd you say? Uh, yeah. What? That don't even make sense. You in the show. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know. You there? Yeah, 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 I'm here. This lady on TV just, I don't care what the lady doing. I'm trying to tell you about something. Distracted. Life is distracting. The world is distracting. The world is full of thorns that will soak and take what you need, which is the word of God, and choke it out of your life, and you have nothing to show for it but more work. Because the world will never be satisfied until you are worked to death. If you ever notice the story of the donkey, if a donkey's on a farm, he's there for one thing, work. Horse, work and play. A donkey is there to work. And the donkey works every single day. The job is never finished, except one day, the only thing that changes is the donkey can't work no more. That's the only thing. The work never stops. The work never gets finished, but the donkey does get old. And at some point, he's just there. He serves no purpose. He gets to eat what is left over, but he is not primary on the list anymore because Nobody care. They just wait for him to live out his days. No respect. Nobody cares about the work that he did. No matter if he was the best donkey ever. Because the work never changes. He can only do so good of a job. You can only till the soil so much. It's still going to eat till next year. So if he does the best job he can, guess what's going to happen next year? He's going to have to do it again. No matter how much he does it, the same exact job is going to need to be done. So people, no matter how good a meal you cook today, <laughs> you're going to have to cook another one tomorrow. <laughs> I don't care how much you put into it, this is going to keep us for a long week. No, you're going to have to do it again tomorrow. No matter how good you drive your kids to school, you're going to have to do it again tomorrow. No matter how much you do today, when you wake up tomorrow, you ain't never going to build a surplus to where you won't have to do some more. Clean your house as best you can. And don't touch nothing. Just look at it. Wait a week and go wipe your finger on something and this need to be clean again. Ain't nothing you can do to avoid the work. It's going to be there. It's just going to be there. The only thing you can do is putting yourself something that's going to take root, that's going to hold on, that's going to be there to where that work, that job, this world can't choke it out of you so that you have some substance to rely on, so that you have something that is not within your power, right, to do, but you are on the receiving end. Notice what the ground did. What did the good soil do? What did, it, what did the good soil do before the seed was thrown on it? Nothing. It was just there. Jesus fed the soil. The only thing that happened is after the seed fell. After the seed fell, the thorns came. After the seeds fell, the ground was not ready to receive. Good soil is not only ready to receive, but it allows what was received to thrive. So the only thing you got to do is be present and not allow anything to choke out the seeds that God has put in your life. Amen. Amen. Amen.
That is the word for the day. Be present. And this is not a series. It's just a one day be present situation. Amen. Amen. Thank God for you being here today. God has a lot in store for you. You just got to be ready to capture it. And you can't allow the world to instill in you things that are not like him. Because those things will take root. It seems like, I don't know if y'all like me, but you ever look at your, your grass and notice how quick the weeds grow compared to the grass? Them little uh, uh, wild onions or them crab grass. All that stuff just get thick, quick. And the grass is trying to grow, but it's done jumped up in March. All the weeds come in March and April. And here it is by the time May roll around and good grass season, the grass, you just cutting a bunch of weeds. Because they want to choke everything out. They grow quick and they attack fast. But you have to be ready. You have to know that when you're present with God, you don't have to worry about nothing else. You can just let him feed you. And all you got to do is eat and receive.